Now, there are sayings that a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. And this is true. And then even in the states, studies have shown that in the states where there's no good health care system and coverage for everyone, they are depressed, the, 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 the mortality rate is high, the, uh, the, the, the average uh, uh, life, uh, life, life expectancy is lower and so on. So definitely a healthy nation is a wealthy nation and that's why we're doing this panel. Healthcare is a very intricate field because it has a, it's not very well known as a business or as a cause, as a charity or you know, or a commodity that we're trying to sell to, pay, to people. The risk tolerance is very little, very narrow. If you can hire an engineer, a lawyer, a plumber, any, any other job, and that you don't do awesome job, you're not gonna be too upset. Okay, the building didn't turn out very beautiful, or blah, blah, blah. But healthcare, the tolerance is zero. Like, if any medical error, you know, it's catastrophic on the patients and on the system as well. But also, it affects a very large sector of the um, society. If you look, you know, the society, whether you're a consumer of the healthcare or you're in the healthcare profession or you're in industries, you, you, that's why you see this panel, you're from all of us. So there's an a, a acronym, which is it's PEST, basically, is the healthcare is governed by four major elements. And that's we'll touch base on all of these four. It's called PEST. PES is, that means P is political environment, what, what's allowed, what's not allowed in a state, in a country, you know, what are the regulations. E is the economic and the environment. Now, if the, the, the government has the economic situations, can dictate also, to some extent, the, the quality of the healthcare. And the environment, the problems in Canada and, and USA are different than problems in Kuwait and, and Saudi Arabia. And the health problems are different. So that's, that's where the, 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 the E. And thirdly, the, the S is the social factors. You know, each community has their own rituals, their own, their own way to deal with the health problems. And lastly, the T is the technology, obviously. Uh, you know, it, it is very heavy on technology, so on. So the aspect we're gonna cover in this panel are the health tourism or medical tourism, or now even some people call it a medical uh, a health uh, uh, resort. The second topic we're going to cover is the how we create connection between the Lebanon and the diaspora. And third, so in that co connection would be in the field of medical research, medical education, and uh, obviously in in the, in, the, in the business side of things. And thirdly, the third topic is medical innovation. And on this panel, you will see that you know, all these talents are represented on this panel. So I would start with the medical uh, collaboration, corporation. Lebanon has proved year after year, over hundreds of years, that it's immune to most of the problems happen in, the middle, in, in Lebanon. The war, the, the, even the financial situation, so on. And the secret for that is truly the diaspora. The diaspora always helped back Lebanon motherland, whether on the education side, or on the economic side, on the financial side, we all support our families uh, you know, abroad. So from that, I will start first with Dr. Kench. Uh, Dr. Kench, you've practiced in the States about 20, about 35 years, okay? And I'm sure like me and a lot of people here, when you go to tell you, when are you gonna come back? When are you gonna work, you know, you know come back to Lebanon? So. What, ha what does it take you to see in the healthcare system in Lebanon that will convince you or entice you to go back? And tell me like in three or four bullet answers, like in what did you like in the American system that you like to transpose back home with you? As you know, Dr. Tanuri, for us who came in 1984 to this country after graduating medical school and then started our residency and uh, fellowship in this country, we learned a special way of practicing medicine that uh, when we go and look at it uh, uh, in, an, in any different way, we will find that that's not the way that we were 
that we practiced in this country and how we expect things to be running. And when you get used to a certain way of practicing medicine, you would like to continue to do that because you would find that that is not only the better way, but the easier way for anybody to practice medicine. Then, when we, when we look at how we practice medicine in this country from the time the patient walks into the office until the patient leaves the office, and how we have uh, secretarial uh, services and then medical assistants and nurses who practically do the job for us, then we spend the time with the patient, we say, okay, this is all what you need, and then we leave the patient's room uh, feeling comfortable that everything will be done the way we discussed it with the patient. So you talk about the system. You have a system. About the system. You have a framework that you can rely here, here, and then probably is not very existent in Lebanon. Exactly. Anymore. It's not as complete in Lebanon. It's, yeah, this is and the simple way where we write the prescriptions for the patient and for tests and for uh, medications. And we take it for granted that everything will be done the way that we practiced it. Well, Tom, well, well said. I feel the same way. Second, mm -hmm. any, another point. What would it take you to, to go back to work in Lebanon? So if you Can I bribe you with money to go back? Exactly. So <laughs> if, you talk, if you talk about the cost of all what we just discussed and whether the patients in Lebanon can uh, afford to do all these tests that we ask from the patient to be. For example, uh, you ask a patient, I need you to do an MRI of the pituitary, being that I'm an endocrinologist. This is a very expensive test that I do a prior authorization, I get it approved, and the patient will have it. If a patient is going to tell me I don't have the money, I don't have the cash to do any of those tests, then my treatment, to change the treatment into a treatment that involves no testing is being done for the patient, becomes more difficult and more discussing, more like, okay, so short of doing an MRI, what else can I do for this patient? I know that I'm, I'm practicing medicine, but not feeling very comfortable about so doing it. Health coverage, you know, and, 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 and burden on the patient. What else? The second thing is the cost of medications. The cost of medications even for Medicare patients in this country are practically... Because we have very horrendous. corrupt... We have very corrupt... <laughs> We're going to talk about the pharma in industry exactly. in Lebanon. Exactly. And in Lebanon, it is also... Uh, it's also an important factor in the care of patients in terms of you prescribe for them the medication and whether the patient would be compliant in taking their medications uh, the, the, the right way and at the right time is also another uh, possibility. We don't have a lot of uh, support system like we do have uh, over here in terms of uh, uh, home care and in terms of uh, rehabilitation and patients that are in the hospital and you want to send them to an acute rehab facility or a subacute rehab facility. Those uh, centers that help patient to be discharged from the hospital quickly and easily are also missing okay. in, in Lebanon, and they practically make our job harder. Very, very well found point. Next, we're going to be touch on, on the uh, academic advancement, and um, Lebanese students have always excelled, you know, any field they went to and in any destination they went to. You know, whether throughout the world. We all know when you go to any country, any university, any hospital, any uh, company, and when they tell you about Lebanese, and they finish their sentence by telling you, he's the best, he's great. So, or she's, or she's, or she's the best, he's great. So, from here, I want to ask Sarah and uh, Bajos. Uh, I want to ask you questions, and I'll, I'll start with Sarah first. What does it take to keep that resource going? And is this drain, brain drain to Lebanon, or it's a wealth to Lebanon? And how can we support that? If it's a, if it's a wealth to Lebanon, how can we promote and support that? And um, how can we pay back, basically? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Matar. I'm currently a third year hematology oncology fellow at MUSC. And I'm very happy to be here to share my story, which I think resonates with a lot of students in the audience today, and most of the Lebanese students in Lebanon, medical students and trainees. 
So when we graduate, I did my med school in AUB, and once we were done, we wanted to come here to the U.S. to get the best training we could get. What is AUB? American University <laughs> of Beirut. Um, and the struggle is real. Uh, we had to go through a lot of loopholes, um, send a bunch of emails to try to get clinical rotations here at the U.S. Um, we basically go through the website of every hospital and look through the, through the names of the attendings. Oh, Tony Tanuri, that sounds Lebanese. Let me email him and see if he would allow me to come and shadow him. Tanuri is Italian. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. From Zahle, yeah. Italian from <laughs> Zahle. I like that. So one of the things that um, the uh, ambassador is trying to uh, promote is try to build this network of healthcare professionals, Lebanese healthcare professionals in the U.S. And one of the things we want to work on is create a database of all the Lebanese American physicians in the U.S. who are interested in helping Lebanese medical students and bring them abroad and make this database accessible to the Lebanese students in Lebanon um, so they don't have to go through all that work. The second problem that we face when we want to come here is the funding. Uh, it's a financially taxing process. We have to pay for the trips, for staying for a month or two for these rotations. And speaking from my experience, I was very blessed by having Lebanese physicians or residents host me at their ha home. And when I asked them, like, how can I pay you back? You guys have been so generous. They told me, Sarah, we pay people forward. And this is a lesson I learned. So by us being here and trying to help those students who are coming by hosting them at our place or maybe create a fund where anyone who's interested in helping Lebanese medical students can contribute to and have this accessible for the Lebanese students. About the question whether it's a drain, of course it's a drain from Lebanon, but I see it as a wealth because we're all here meeting today so that we can give back to Lebanon, everyone in their own expertise and way. So um, me, my passion is trying to help the students who are now in Lebanon, trying to come to the U.S., make the process easier for them. That's, that's definitely so. I will, I will be contacting you in the next year or so because I want to see where you are with that project. All right. Okay. You want to be on board? Absolutely. All I would right. love to. I would love to. So uh, next, I, uh, Bachos, uh, do you have anything to add in that field? And I want to ask you a follow-up question to that. She's talked about the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the academic promotions and residency and so on. I want also to touch base on top of that on the research and, you know, how can they use the research to their advantage, you know, in, the, you know, in this country to reach where they want as a springboard. So now in the U.S., I don't know if I might say that. Yeah. So now in the U.S., uh, most of the medical doctors, what's more important, not only to finish your medical school, it's also to do your research. So any professional, uh, uh, any uh, specialties that you go into residency always requires you to do research, whether you do clinical research or whether you do basic science research. So I'm a professor of uh, neurology at the Harvard Medical School and uh, uh, I direct the neuroscience center and my focus is uh, to try to find a cure for a brain, brain tumor. And one of the things that we always get, Tony, from Lebanon, for instance, yes, Sarah said, so most of the time they contact you, your name sounds Lebanese, yes, we will send it to you. So I'd like to stress more a lot about the underprivileged people in Lebanon, or underprivileged students who might not come, out, come from a very famous university like the American University of Beirut, or who might not come from a, a, a culture where they had the chance to explore their options. So for instance, AUB does a wonderful job, and our so Lebanese American universities, and several others, they do a wonderful job at introducing their students to the network, not necessarily put them in contact directly with the person, but at least give them the opportunity here. This is historically what we've, what we've done. Those are historically our students. They've gone to many beautiful places or best places in the world. This is the trend that you should be taking. This is the route that you should be taking. Now, if we talk about underprivileged uh, students, for instance, even students that come from the Lebanese University, which is very dear to my heart, because I was at one point an underprivileged student. So those are the students that I, they, 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 they even have much harder time. Yes, funding is always an issue. And our job as a diaspora is we can't do it on our own. We need support also from the Lebanese side. 
So honestly, several occasions I tried to, I have an exchange, official exchange program between Harvard and several universities in Europe where students from Europe, medical students, medical uh, doctors, or, or they're doing their basic science research, they have an opportunity to come and visit our center and they spend one year, two years, three years, or four years. They're fully funded by both ways. Their salary is supported by the university, where they, their home institution. Their research is 100% supported by the housing institution like Harvard and any others. And we have a panel of not only myself, many, many of us uh, that support this uh, process that they don't necessarily have to come and work under my supervision. They can we put them in a network, whatever their research of interest. They might be interested in endocrinology, they might be interested in neuroscience, they might be interested in something else. So then they have the opportunity to, to do so. And I would love to set up a very similar program officially with Lebanon or some universities in Lebanon where they could actually have these opportunities without taking a bias, a bias against certain universities in Lebanon or certain type of people from Lebanon. Absolutely. Yeah. I, am, I am proudly also a product of Lebanese University as well. Yeah. Thank you. So research, the basic elements of research are research requires money and money and money and money <laughs> and discipline and know-how. Okay. Skills. So why are you robbing a bank? Why are you robbing a bank? Because that's where the money is. So the money is she Aida. Aida. Uh, so Aida, uh, she's in, uh, at the uh, NIH. And she does have also access to a lot of money if you guys need money. What does, uh, what does NIH stand for? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so uh, Aida, uh, tell us. Um, how, in your capacity as a good Lebanese soldier, soldier how can you help the, the, the Lebanese at home and abroad to promote their, their mission and their causes? You know, through what you do. Explain to the audience what you do and, and how you can help. Sure. So, is my mic on? Yeah. No, yeah, just come Can you me. hear me? B Bernard, could you okay. grab the mic, lift it up for her? Yeah. I said the mic, uh, Bernard. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Oh, but tenuri, but tenuri. So, um, I work at the National Institute of Health. Uh, like many of you, I came here as a student. I uh, graduated from AUB. I hit the glass ceiling very quickly in Lebanon. I wanted to do science. I wanted to, to publish papers, not to read about them, but to actually do those experiments with my own hands. So I came here, I did my PhD, and um, as you were mentioning, Lebanese students are very hardworking. I worked day and night for four years. I had no weekends, no vacations, and I finished my PhD. After that, I did uh, my research in the cancer biology field. I worked at Sloan Kettering at the National Cancer Institute. And then I realized that, as a Lebanese, I love to create networks and foster connections, um, create connections between people, so I shifted my, uh, my focus more on the commercialization side of science. Um, and in my current capacity at NIH, I manage uh, technology transfer. So I work in trying to bring all the government inventions from NIH in the field of cancer immunotherapy and cell therapy and to build bridges with industry, with biotech and pharma industry, and to try to find partners to run joint clinical trials, to commercialize, to take it through FDA approval, and so on. So now, sure. NIH, um, as um, Dr. Tony mentioned, is, is, the, is the backbone of research in America. We are a $4 billion organization, and we fund 90% of uh, the research in academic institutions. But NIH is also a, a resource for international scholars, and many people don't know that. Um, NIH has 27 institutes dedicated to different diseases, but one of those institutes is called Fogarty International Center. Um, Fogarty's budget is $75 million a year, and this money gets sent to researchers, academics, scientists, uh, graduate students in developing worlds, in the developing world, um, in the form of grants, fellowships, training opportunities, and so on. And so this is a huge resource that Lebanese researchers and clinicians can tap into, um, an enormous amount of funding um, that they can get. 
Um, and Fogarty sets the grants up in a way that they would take the Lebanese researcher and um, create a collaboration with an American institution and an American investigator here, and it would be a joint collaboration. So not only would the Lebanese scientists get access to the funding, they would also get access to the infrastructure, the facilities, the data, the technology, all of that through, the, through this joint collaboration. So this is a, a huge resource that um, many of our clinicians and scientists should tap into. Um, I would like to mention too, there are a lot of international development agencies. The US um, AID is one agency that funds a lot of research around the world, around the Middle East. There are private NGOs, the Gates Foundation, and many others, a very long list of NGOs and organizations that would fund uh, research uh, going on in Lebanon and the Middle East. So, um, Tony, if, if I may add, sorry, just one thing, which is, I think, very perfect. important. So just to add to what she said, it's a success story also. There's NIH also has a specific program for third world country yeah. to enhance their research and to, uh, to help them to, to gain access, not only the infrastructure that are in the U.S., to actually build their own infrastructure in, in countries like Lebanon. And those are the things that not many people are aware of, unfortunately. Fabulous. So I, uh, I could see Shadi. Um, Shadi is uh, the uh, director of research at our lab, at our institution. So I can see him drooling over you, <laughs> you, know, you know. That's one of the reasons why. So the, uh, before I move away from this subject, in 10 seconds per panelist, um, anything that we'd like to in discuss in 10 seconds, you know, about this? Anything, did we miss anything to cover research, medical education? If you don't have, that's fine, we can move I, to I would like to add a point uh, that uh, Dr. Tanous uh, talked about a little bit, which is the collaboration between the U.S. Um, medical schools and the Lebanese medical schools, so creating more programs. Um, so, for example, at MUSC, where I train, there's a Every year, they take two MD-PhD students from AUB, bring them to MUSC to do PhD program, then continue medical school at MUSC. I was not part of this program, unfortunately, but I know a lot of students who really benefited from this program. So if we can have the Lebanese, American physicians who are in leadership roles in academic institutions try to foster similar collaborations, that would be very helpful. Very good. So, thank you. Next, I would like to uh, uh, move to the subject of uh, health tourism uh, or medical tourism. And if you look into it, some people now they're calling a health resorts. Uh, so, medical tourism or health tourism is really indigenous in Lebanon. It's it's in our our DNA, and Lebanon has always been the hospital bed of the Middle East. But the problem is that Lebanon is falling behind. I go to Saudi Arabia, I go to Bahrain, I go to Jordan, I go to Egypt. And I find even, even within Saudi Arabia now there are medical tourism. People go to Saudi Arabia to get treated there. They go to Bahrain to get treated there, to Thailand, to Jordan, to Egypt. And, and Lebanon is not on the number one list anymore. It used to, it used to be. And this is a real economy. You know, the, think about, about it's 10% of GDP of Cuba. It's $5 billion industry in, 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 uh, in uh, India. In three years, it went up five folds in, uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in India. So it's a real economy, and we should be capitalized on it. And you think, if you think about it, definition, health, tourism, health plus tourism. Okay, so it's basically tourism component and health. Now, the question is I'm going to ask Asper, and uh, you are on the Lebanese Health Energy, which is a sister uh, 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 initiative like Lebanese Diaspora Energy. Um, what do you do? What's the mission? What are the top four, three or four points that you're trying to address that particular point? Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, uh, so happy and pleased and honored to be among you today. Um, 
Uh, allow me to present myself very briefly. Uh, I'm uh, Asma Saliba. I'm a doctor in clinical pharmacy. I served my country, Lebanon, uh, for 10 years uh, approximately as a community pharmacist. I run my own business. I have always uh, found that uh, my job uh, goes beyond being a, a pharmacist uh, doing counseling and um, I realized with time that my country uh, needs me and uh, every single healthcare professional to be exerting a more profound uh, role in terms of um, updating uh, laws, new laws uh, for health, uh, new regulations, um, um, uh, doing awareness campaigns in rural areas, uh, thus uh, educating people about health and how tremendously it can affect uh, the, uh, health, the expenditure on health. Uh, so uh, also allow me to do, to be able to, pre to answer your question, Dr. Tanuri. Yes. To do a small presentation about LHE. Uh, also, um, it's a big responsibility uh, to be uh, serving uh, as a president of Lebanese Health Energy, which is a new non-gov uh, organization. Uh, founded by Minister Basile uh, and many co-founders uh, as well to serve uh, health in Lebanon. Uh, also allow me to thank all LDE uh, organizers uh, for, th for such a real extravaganza, joining Lebanese diaspora along with some Lebanese citizens, thus inciting us as uh, per mentioned uh, by Ambassador uh, Aisa uh, to commit uh, to our successes uh, for the proliferation and flourishing of Lebanon. Uh, you will be seeing uh, along while I'm doing my speech a small presentation on health tourism. Please feel free to uh, look at it. The Lebanese Health Energy Association uh, has been registered last year in May 2018. Uh, its network will operate within LHE as a national and multinational mechanism for multi-sectoral collaboration and dialogue on health workforce policies, thus studying challenges for each health sector and looking for opportunities as to improve health system in Lebanon. Health sectors are the heart and soul of health systems, yet, uh, as we know it, our Lebanon is faced with a chronic shortage of a solid health strategic plan. As a universal truth, it states that there is no health without a talented professional workforce devoted to draw this health strategic plan to overcome the major obstacles and achieve our health goals, including nationwide health coverage and aging plan. And that's why our biggest challenge is to preserve on calling all stakeholders in health system, thus uniting all on one main goal, to draw this health strategic plan, thus working concomitantly, hand in hand, for its realization. Um, LHE Association uh, is created as a platform. A platform, why? A platform for action, and why? To address health crisis for the private and public sectors, thus reinforcing collaboration, awareness campaigns for prevention of diseases and improvement of quality of life, as well as new possible potential health law proposals to the Lebanese government. So, the LHE will be working as in partnership whenever possible and always needed with all national governments, civil society, international agencies, finance institutions, researchers, educators, professional associations, health syndicates and orders, national and international health non-governmental organizations dedicated to identifying, implementing, advocating for solutions. And since its inspection in March 2018, the LHE is acting as a national convener, mobilizing nationwide attention to the health gaps for health crisis and working on generating political will and action for positive change. So our main objective are... Asma, 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds. 30? Seconds. This is too little. 30 seconds. One minute. <laughs> so we need to assist the... <laughs> okay, I will talk about the objectives later on along. Uh, 
So from LGE Lebanon, uh, May 2019, uh, now to LGE Washington, 2019, September now, today, the inclusion of LHE as part of LGE mission and vision mirrors directly the heartfelt concern of our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jobran Basile, founder of LHE, about health in Lebanon, thus seeking to improve people's quality of life on the humanitarian level and to strengthen the bilateral collaboration between Lebanese citizens and Lebanese diaspora health professionals on the strategic level, thus building new horizons for health in Lebanon and applying the slogan, health for all, all hope for health. Why this slogan? Because we believe so what? next, Bernard, sit down here, come, come. One second, come, come, come. one come, second. Come. I missed you, come here. One second. Because we believe that uh, we, we, we can have health for all, uh, health, uh, whenever all healthcare professionals are united all together, we can achieve health to all Lebanese people. Why the Lebanese diaspora? Because they are used to have lots of efforts, proven their success, they are hungry for work, eager to prosper and ready to engage. And the health sector is a transformative one in Lebanon as it translates the well-being of living when it is well-functioning and mirrors the, economic of the, the economy of the country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. <laughs> My conclusion. Okay. La last, but, last but not least, sorry about being late. I'm a kind of little bit stubborn. I will do my conclusion. Uh, <laughs> health is a human right that foreruns all other rights, as per Minister Basile, and you add to it, healthcare is not a luxury, it's not, it is an absolute right. And patients who have the greatest need are the ones left behind and the ones who will benefit most from our interventions. We need to protect our Lebanese wealth, our Lebanese human wealth, Let's collaborate on health. Thank you for your attention. As much she knows that I cannot say no to beautiful ladies. Just Thank you. So next. Next, um, next time I'll wear a skirt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Bernard, um, you are the example of the American saying, if you need something done, give it to a busy man or a woman, okay? So you're very proliferative, you're very productive. Um, by the way, I can think of somebody else who's also can fit that criteria, our uh, ambassador, our uh, excellent uh, 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 Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Gibran Basile, so he can, he definitely fit that criteria. So. Uh, what are the, if I, if I ask you to name th you know, the most important three elements for successful health tourism? Thank you, Tony. Uh, you invited me here for as being a pharmaceutical guy, and uh, we are, I'm Bernard Tanuri, so I'm a chairman of a pharmaceutical group where we, it's bad, it's bad. Yeah. So, and, uh, but let me add, before we go to the pharmaceutical, what is my success and why I was successful because I was successful because I love myself and I love Lebanon. But let me add on what asthma, I won't take long, uh, did. So being, I am one of the guys that stayed in Lebanon and I'm taking it out of, from Lebanon to the world rather than take it from Lebanon to, uh, to Lebanon. So, uh, I did a successful enterprise, a pharmaceutical and a health company. Uh, what we did to add on a very, very important subject, which is the health tourism. The health tourism, we have good hospitals in Lebanon, and we're surrounded in two countries where, as Dr. Tony said, they are, became very specialized. Yet, we did look in Lebanon where to come to bring the best balance of the economy that we have to bring some uh, tourism uh, for the health sector to Lebanon. We looked into the diaspora first, so we're inviting people abroad to come to Lebanon. And most importantly, what we can take a fast cash is we looked at the uh, uh, consumer market. Consumer market meaning that uh, markets or countries that do not have uh, fully integrated hospital care and medical care. 
An example is Iraq. For example, in Iraq, their health system has been destroyed. In that purpose, uh, why I'm talking about that? Because we as a company also, we did some agreement for health tourism in, uh, in Lebanon to bring patients from abroad. And we did that with different hospitals, mainly the governmental hospitals, and we're also agreeing with the private sector. So we did sign just last uh, in July, we signed an agreement between the two ministries to bring in the patients straight from Baghdad, for example, all, all of Iraq, to uh, the Lebanese hospitals. So by that, we're bringing uh, new patients uh, to be treated in Lebanon. Saying that, it has been done uh, the first time with Iraqi we took because it's a because of the ties that we have with Iraq. So uh, the, we went with a delegation with the Lebanese minister to Iraq and vice versa. The, Lebanese, the Iraqi minister of health came to Lebanon and we did such agreements. So this is going to give a big push to the hospitals in Lebanon to serve the environment, the, which is, for example, now in Iraq. In October, we're going to Oman, for example, where also they have health and expats. The same is going to be in Bahrain, because as you know, the Arab countries, especially the Gulf, they dispatch lots of patients to, uh, to Jordan, to Turkey, to Europe, and Lebanon has lost a lot from this opportunity of bringing in patients from uh, the Middle East surrounding countries. Sorry, I took, I shifted, but I had to talk about that because you mentioned the health tourism. It's very important so to bring, so there are lots of consumer. So we go there, we serve, and by that was also sending kind of, if you want, medical diplomats and opening hubs into those countries to do diagnostic and bring them to the local markets. Sorry, Tony, I intervened. I uh, shifted a little bit from you from the question. I don't know if you want to give me time to talk we'll, about myself. We'll, we'll go back to that, actually. <laughs> so from the panelists, uh, in 20 seconds each. Can I? Can you, yeah, I need from, you know, any, anything we missed that let's can touch do. base, 20 seconds each, except. Uh, uh, That's my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, Tony, I want to ask you. I mean. I'm not that allowed sorry. to talk anymore. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> My, my, my journey in the medical field started with my uh, daughter, dying daughter. My daughter was 12 years old, she has the cancer. And uh, uh, the way we brought our families, the love of Lebanon, and she, one month before she died, she said, Daddy and Mommy, I want to be buried in Lebanon if I die. I know I'm dying now. So, do, do one second there. I mean, please in the back, uh, there's little noise, please. If you want to have a conversation, have it outside. So, uh, we carry her wishes. We were living in Boston. We carried our buried to Lebanon, and she's buried in Lebanon. To me, before she died, she said, Daddy, I wanted to help blind people like me. And I started my mission. I came to Canada, to the National Research Council, and I walk in and I told the management there, I said, I wanna, I'm here, I wanna use your facilities to find a way to kill the killer of my daughter. They look at me and said, well, I think you're in the wrong place. I said, gentlemen, you went too far. The killer of my daughter was the cancer and I want to find a way using your lab to kill the cancer. And we start, I start my mission. You work. We need, we need to move on. Bachos, you had to say something. I just wanted to say one word, which I don't know if some, we missed it. The first patient on a clinical trial that was treated in Lebanon. It is a big deal because no clinical trials are typically done in Lebanon. No new drug testing is usually done in Lebanon. So when, when, when he says one patient, first patient ever treated on a clinical trial in Lebanon, please, it is a big deal. So fabulous, and uh, when we 
before we move on to the medical innovation, um, uh, I would like to touch on two points which we did not discuss is the medical errors in Lebanon. And uh, medical errors in Lebanon um, sh should, not, should not be prosecuted over on the OTV or NTV or LBC or any other t television. There should be locations for that. That should be uh, by the Ministry of Health, by the Syndicate of, of, the, of um, Physicians, and by a um, medical court. If I have error here, and if, 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 I, if, I have, if I commit any error with my patients here in America, nobody knows. Even my, my, my colleague in the same department does not know. There are body who looks of the chart or the events and then they go full investigations, and if I'm guilty, that the patients get his or her right. And if I'm not guilty, I'm exonerated, but it doesn't go to the media. And why it's important, because you know, who would jump on a flight, on a plane, where there's 1% chance of, of you crashing? Nobody. And if, if, you, if you want to bring that, that, that patient from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from Jordan, from Iraq, you know, bring them to Lebanon, and when they, when they see on the TV every day that there is, this doctor did this, this patient walked to the hospital and did not walk out, walked, uh, walked out on a wheelchair, that's not a good uh, 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 environment for, for medical tourism. So I think that that should be addressed at the government level as well. Um, and most of the time is not a true story. Most of the time yes. it's a false testimonial. Absolutely, absolutely. And most of the time it, it's a, uh, uh, you know, just reaction uh, from the media. So the, our last segment on this panel will be on the medical innovation. So the basic elements for um, uh, uh, medical innovation. Uh, when I was working on my patents and my development with Johnson Johnson, and I just realized how many elements they have to go all in place to come up with a product. You know, you have the, of course, the company money. You have the patent lawyer. You have the corporate lawyer. You have the engineers, you have like five, six, six different engineers, like a, 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 a IT engineering and, and so on. Quality assurance, you have, you have the regulatory guy, the marketing guy, the sales guy, and all of these factors go in. My question is, you know, to Bernard, are we hopeless? You know, when we have, you know, all of these elements that have to fall in place, and yet, you know, you are a proven success story to, in Lebanon to innovate from Lebanon and abroad. What is the secret sauce? What, what, how did you do it? It's, there's no secret sauce. Whatever you did in the US, we've been trying to do in Lebanon. We're a pharmaceutical company. People, even here in the audience, they do not know that we do bring biotech. The, bring the mic down a little bit. That, the, that we do biotechnology products. We do cancer drugs out of Lebanon. So, but we had it the hard way. So we had to contract with those engineers, patent lawyers, uh, regulatory to develop the products, all the IP, all the M&As, all the financing. We didn't have access to the NIH, so we went all private. So we created just recently a platform that is offered to the innovators, to the, any innovator that's coming up with any innovation. So whether is it, and we're contracting with all the universities in Lebanon, we're contracting with several universities here in the US and in Europe to bring in innovations and being developed in Lebanon. So saying that, and lots of services are being done outside of the uh, country, outside of Lebanon. Mainly it's the IP, because we do not have IP lawyers to draft proper patents or check if the product is patentable to, at, the, at the first stage. And we are doing also, so all those services that you were mentioning, Tony, on top of that, there is the regulatory, there's the IRBs, the CROs, all of that uh, that are outsourced, not in Benta. We are outsourcing that. So we offer this to any innovation to bring it to the market and being developed as clinically in Lebanon. So we are doing clinical studies in Lebanon, very innovative ones that are not done even in the US, hoping that we build it up. We add a pilot plant and then pilot study and then come to the US or to Europe, build it up and sell it to the big boys, to the big pharma guys, where they have the muscles of marketing and sales to sell it all over the world. So what we are doing is really giving the chance to any innovator to take all the 
elements that are not available into one segment. So we're putting on one platform, one ecosystem that is, and this is not depending on Benta, it's Hynova, it's health innovation ecosystem that is serving everybody and everybody can benefit, including the Lebanese diaspora living in the U.S. and Europe. Well, well, well said. Uh, I mean, uh, you're innovator yourself and you have very, as we call it in the States, long shot innovations, uh, artificial kidney and so on. Uh, what does it take uh, us <laughs> to Lebanon to convince you to go down to Lebanon, giving two enticing you know, uh, uh, factors that say, yes, I will move, I will collaborate with the Lebanese uh, partner, or I will move my business to Lebanon? My um, love to Lebanon and... Um, we all love Lebanon. Give me something concrete. So what, 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 well, what, would you like, what would you like to, be, to see from uh, His Excellency to say, <laughs> we, get, we can offer you one and two? Okay. Uh, I'd like to go to Lebanon because right now I uh, fulfill one of the biggest mission that I have in my hand, which is the kidney, artificial kidney, no more dialysis, hopefully. And uh, the, uh, the world in 30 years increased 32%. The kidney diseases and dialysis increased 1,600%. Yep. What we eat, the, uh, uh, and the environment, and the fast food and whatnot. So our kidney has is punished. And uh, so, uh, and thank God I was able to finally, after long research, long hours of work, able to get the uh, artificial kidney, wearable kidney, no more dialysis. Dialysis have to go three times a week to the, uh, the patient, uh, to the hospital between four to six hours. Uh, under uh, a uh, you know 20 liters of fluid by pump into his system, so the kidney is sick, it be sicker and sicker. But with this wearable artificial kidney, wear it, and you have dialysis continuously, so the patient feels normal, and uh, so uh, this gives a chance to the sick kidney to uh, uh, build up itself back okay. again. So with that, I would like to give a <laughs> we would like to give our closing remarks, you know, on this session. And uh, when we first uh, started discussing having conference calls among each other, and I told him, I don't like these, you know, panels where we meet and everybody goes home. And you know, and I thought that maybe we should put it as a task um, uh, force. We would take people from the audience as well if they want to join us eventually. We would like to come up with the concrete steps that we can eventually um, propose to, to, uh, to, to, to the Lebanese uh, authorities, basically, and how can we move the needle, uh, as we say. So the, the healthcare and the medical tourism can be truly the, the, the catalyst for the next you know, uh, 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 financial uprising of Lebanon. And for that, we need to, to have the Ministry of Health, of Health involved. We need the Ministry of Environment. You know, we have to have a beautiful country for people to have tourism uh, as well. Uh, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Justice, you know, to, to have to regulate, you know, the, the, the conflict of interest and regulate um, uh, conflicts between companies, medical companies, and, and, and so on. Uh, and also, of course, the, the hospital syndicate and, and special universities. We have to come up with the truly specialized talents in Lebanon. You know, we don't, as, as, as you heard from uh, Bernard, he outsourced almost all services. Where are those, you know, lead engineers? Where are the patent lawyers? Where are the corporate lawyers who deal with the healthcare? And, and so we don't have those in Lebanon. If you want to do prototype of, a, of an invention, you have to get it out, done uh, outside. And, and, and so on. So we need to develop those skills, and that should be part of your, you know, mission, Bernard. Working with these universities to tell them, you know, you need to to, to train people for certain skills that we don't have in Lebanon now. We have, technically, operationally, we have, industrially, we have. What we do not have is the IP um, and the finance. This is really still missing uh, in Lebanon. And, and regulatory, on regulatory, we do not have technical people that they understand the regulatory process outside of the Lebanese. So to come and file within the US FDA or with the European MAO, this is where we are lacking. And finally, we have a, not request, but a hope 
that very soon the, the uh, uh, Ministry of Refugees will be eliminated, Re Ministries of Media and Sports should be eliminated, and we should create Ministry uh, for Planning and Innovation instead. Because that Ministry of Planning and Innovation, it, it, it will co collaborate with all these entities, you know, the, the stakeholders in this, and I think it, it definitely it will, it will make a difference in our country. And I want to thank everyone, and I want to thank your attention. You know, thank you. 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 Thank you.